What I'm interested in is that you've been there, you studied the Gulag, you wrote about fascism, you wrote about Eichmann, you've seen what's going on in your area of the world, and you know so many things through your movie. So the big question, where is that evil comes from? What is it that, by experience or by your study, you start to understand about, the, about evil? I, you know, I think, again, I would begin with the, you know, your, your idea that barbarianism has somehow come back, and I would argue that it never went away, and, that, and I would pick up on this point about dehumanization that a couple of people have alluded to, and, I, and, and the point about power, um, because the, the human instinct to make oneself better by making others worse, by diminishing, by um, destroying, by dehumanizing um, other people seems to me very profound, and I don't have a I don't have an anthropological or a psychological explanation for it, but even as some of you have been mentioning some of the things that, that have been done around the world, I hear echoes. You know, you're, you know being, being told that your language is not important. Well, when Hitler came into Poland, one of the things he did was he told people they weren't allowed to speak Polish. And so, for example, my father-in-law um, speaks German, well, he, he's passed away, but he spoke some German because when he was a child and he went to school, he was not allowed to speak Polish in school. He could only speak German, because that was the occupying language. Um, when the Soviet Union was seeking to Sovietize Ukraine, starting in the 1930s, what did they do? They eliminated the language. Um, and so the attempt to eliminate other cultures through eliminating language or through um, eliminating symbols or through eliminating religion, um, or through downplaying, you know, our religion is better than yours. And, and incidentally, the word religion, I'm not, I, I have mixed feelings about, because you know, although I do believe that, of course, the acts that we saw in Paris last night were connected to radical Islam, um, and they involve an interpretation, they are an interpretation of Islam, um, I think that's very different from saying that they're about religion. I mean, you, you know, the, you know, it was, it's, it's, it, you know, the radical communism, you know, the Bolshevism that was used to excuse the murder of, of millions of people, um, had a lot in common linguistically with the language of the, the moderate left. I mean, if you, if you, they sometimes read the same texts, you know, if people read Marxism, Marx, on the in the center left, and they read it in, in the Soviet Union. But the interpretation of it and the way in which it was used to gain and maintain and hold power and discriminate against enemies was very specific. So the, the radical Islamist use of religion in a specific way, which is very similar to the um, to the to the Nazi use of national ideas or the Soviet use of communist ideas. Uh, this is the impulse that that connects these things. Not you know, religion isn't in that sense isn't different. I mean, it's a it's another. This is this is the contemporary form of expressing that kind of fanaticism. But we've seen it before, and many of the techniques and patterns are are, are very similar. So. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not equipped. I'm not a, I'm not a theologian, um, as I say, or a, or a psychiatrist. But I mean, clearly there is something that is innate. You know, that human beings, des there is a, there's a, uh, there are some people who desire to think in this way, and it has expressed itself in different forms in different times, and it doesn't go away. And the only thing we can do is find a moderate language in which to speak about it, and to try to create political institutions and incentives and um, which, which, reduce its, um, which reduce its range. And we did do that in Europe after the Second World War, um, and we did have an alternate ideology, and we did have an alternate way of thinking, and the question is whether that was, is now strong enough to motivate new generations or not. I think we can do a little bit more. Uh, we can stop to accept every explanation. Uh, we are so eager to understand what happened uh, that we are listen very carefully to the explanation a person uh, gives to us. And uh, we try to be psychologists or... No, I didn't want to be. I'm no, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> not myself. But, but we are... Um, Explanations are very welcome, and to hear the reasons of a perpetrator is something we like. Why? Why couldn't we say, don't you dare tell me that there's a reason for this 
act for this behavior. Um, we have to deny some explanations. We have to say to people, no, sorry, there is no explanation for special deeds. But and we have to concentrate on the deeds. If you don't look for the explanation, you shall not, you shall not have any solution. Yes, it. you have to listen to this explanation. Not but this to is listen, something... to analyze, listen. Yes. If you have also so many people, excluded people, frustrated people, alienated people, this is a basis also for, for what we call barbarism. Yes, uh, but it is a difference to have a scientific interest into explanations and to find the origins of evil and so high questions, but to deal with special, even young people. Young people need to know what is a real explanation and what is not. What is a true way to think and only a way to refuse uh, justifications or, or may... responsibility. And it's, it's a, we have, we ask what um, can we do? And not, it's not only listen, a question of scientific I ask interest. some people, um, my best friends, how do you associate barbarian with? And of course, first of all, it was ISIS, uh, terrorists also, but very many also identified barbarian with the tabloids with uh, modern TV, with uh, behavior of the fan of clubs, sporting clubs. This is also barbed in, in customs, in habits, which is, in a way, it could be a step to another barbarism. But also what you are saying is that, and I agree with you, that barbarism is such a ridiculously inflated word that is used, is deployed, against people we don't like. Yeah. Um, this morning for breakfast, we had some pop music for about three minutes, and I thought, How, why don't they stop this barbaric music? <laughs> now, you know, as I was reading on my iPad <laughs> about the really barbaric events which had gone on in, in, in Paris. So you know, we, we do have this very generic word. But we need explanations. I'm sorry, my job, let me finish. My job uh, is to find explanations, not justifications. I don't need a job to justify or not justify. I can condemn like everybody else, okay? This is a human right. But my job is to try to find explanation. Why is it that these people, whether it's a small group or whether it's the Gulag or Nazi Germany or something. And here we have two different typologies of, of evil, what you call state-induced, which in a way, let's take it a bit more, culture-induced. You are part of a culture which justifies whatever it is that, that you do. You are a conformist. You are part of a group. And then the other kind of evil, you are a non-conformist. You go completely against the, the, the grain. The people who did what they did last night were both, were conforming to what they thought was an ideology, and therefore taking enormous self-satisfaction, presumably because they were part of this grandiose project and so on. And at the same time, they were acting like um, anti-bourgeois terrorists, saying, ah, look what we are doing. We are going to scare all of you. We are going to, you know, we are going to change France. Wow, you know, what a fantastic moment of power it they, was, they, they it have. It was very Bolshevik. It was, a, it was a so, yeah, well, you call it Bolshevik, but, you know, frankly, Go back in history. It's just, you know, it's one after the other. It is absolutely, unfortunately, nothing new. One of the bad things about a historian, being a historian, and why many people don't like us, really, is because, because we are terribly boring, because, um, because commentator and social scientist and journalist and so on says, this is a new thing, this has never happened before. And we arrive and we say, uh, uh, uh. It actually happened before. You know how how tedious. You know once there was a, a fish scientist. I'm sure it's made up. Who thought that the goldfish going around a particular uh, um, uh, thing? What do you keep the bowl? The, a bowl. You know takes about seven seconds. And because their memory is seven seconds, they have a most fantastic life because they keep on saying, "Wow, <laughs> I've never been here before. Oh, this is really exciting." And the historian is a fish with an eight-second memory, goes behind and says, nah, you were there seven seconds ago, you were there seven seconds ago. Well, 
<laughs> but, but sometimes, historians, I'm only a philosopher, so I, so I can't say it. Um, but sometimes, historians are so eager to find examples fitting to their theories that they are not able to see new things. And I think... <laughs> um, it's a risk. I think the, the, a new problem dealing with explanation is that we have very intelligent and experienced liars. They knew our love to wisdom, our love to explanations, our curiosity, our will to understand. And they are able to give us explanations we want to hear. Uh, my case, Adolf Eichmann, is one perfect example for it. He knew perfectly well what people want to see and wanted to hear, and they gave it to them. And even the most cleverest people um, fall into the trap of this lies. So I think uh, we should talk a bit more about our expectations what, uh, what could be an explanation for evil. Oh. And we want to understand it. We, we really want to understand it. And this makes us sometimes weak.